This footage from the summer of 1943 shows a Cossack commander involved in an anti-partisan operation in the Caucasus. As the gradual withdrawal of the Wehrmacht out of the region continued, partisan activity from behind the lines and Soviet pressure at the front increased. This is part three in a series on a diary that covers this period. An der Kaukasus Front. In parts one and two, the writer of our diary, a German corporal named Fritz, describes how his unit left their position at Krimskaya and began making their way west towards the Strait of Kerch. By chance, he has turned out to be quite a good writer, describing not only what he sees, but also how the situation makes him feel and what he thinks about their Romanian allies, the locals, and the Cossacks who are fighting alongside the Germans. I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters for making the purchase of this original diary possible. If you are not yet a member, please consider becoming one. As a member, you also get access to exclusive film footage on my website, military1945.com. Open a free account there and take a look at some example footage. But now, let's get back to Fritz and his diary. March 1st, 1943. Oben on einem Hang, we drive up a steep road that leads up to a grouping of houses overlooking a cliff. The road is quite muddy, but taking a run at the incline, we are able to make it up. The small town at the top gives a poor and primitive impression that even in Russia we have seldom seen. The small houses are built out of clay. Even the roofs are formed of it. Many of the houses are falling apart. There are neither roads nor even paths in this forgotten town. The residents have been all but cut off from the rest of the world here. There's really nothing here. Even the water has to be brought from one kilometer away. But the view from the top, again, it's amazing. In front of us is the Black Sea. To the left is a lake, and in the background are the Caucasian mountains, seemingly rising up out of the water to the heavens. We continue our journey to the northwest through the night. As the roads curve their way through the dunes, it feels as though we are actually making our way through the desert. Then suddenly the scenery changes and to the left and right we pass through wheat fields as far as the eye can see. At close inspection we realize that it's all wheat from last year that has never been harvested. What a valuable commodity that has gone completely to waste. In the middle of one of these fields, we consider stopping to sleep. It's wintry and at night gets quite cold, so sleeping out in the open is not wise. Then comes the order that we will be staying here for the next three to five days, so we'll just have to make the best of it. Everyone jumps to action. Some set up tents. Others try to make their vehicles as comfortable as possible. Those that are traveling in trucks have it the easiest because of the extra space. Our bureau wagon gets completely unpacked. The boxes are positioned to form a platform to sleep on and in the middle an oven is set up that we fortunately were able to bring with us in the truck. But where are we going to find wood? The first thing that gets destroyed to be burned are the wooden boxes that held the maps, then boxes that held the folders of regulations. The contents of both are packed in alternative locations. Quickly the inside of the truck warms up, which is the most important thing. A little warmth and pleasant atmosphere and the soldiers quickly forget the stress and toil of the long day. We play music and the cook pulls out bottles of sect from his vehicle, which gets drunk by candlelight. In a boisterous atmosphere, we talk about Russia and the Caucasus, wondering whether we'll ever be back. At the time, we didn't even know for sure that we'd be leaving. We don't talk much about the terrible experiences we've had. We concentrate on the wonderfully hot summer days and talk about how much we've each matured personally. 
We talk about the plentiful plums and melons and that delicious sweet wine. When conversation turns to our lost comrades that will stay here in the Caucasus, we're somber. Recently, we've seen how our soldiers have been ordered to remove the grave markers from all the German cemeteries to make sure that the Russians can't disturb their final resting place. None of this is a good omen of what's to come. We talk about home. Everyone speaks about their family, about their wives or girlfriends. Heinz, our draftsman, proudly talks about his son, Hein Volka, who is now already four months old and has never seen his father. Finally, we get back to our usual topic of conversation, vacation. It's been eight months since any of us has gone on leave. We are entitled to leave every year, so should be expecting it soon, shouldn't we? Well, no, that will just remain a dream, as we know that every soldier here in Russia is critical. Heinz and I play chess. I was doing so well, but in the end, he manages to beat me. Tomorrow I'll get even. After a while, everyone falls off to sleep, and a symphony of loud snoring begins. Here is the map of the Caucasus region that we've been focusing on in this series. With this order of battle, or OOB map, you can see how the German units that made up the 17th Army and the attacking Soviet forces were positioned on March 1st of 1943, the day in the diary that we just went through. On my website, military1945.com, OOB maps like this are being constantly added, so go take a look. Thanks for watching, and please remember to subscribe.